Well, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us for the uh, this webinar session. My name is Fernando, and I'm happy to be your webinar host today. I come with the Region 9 Head Start Association. Uh, feel free to contact me via the chat option of Zoom with any logistical questions you may have uh, throughout today's session. Um, and that could include uh, any audio issues, connection, video, any of those issues, please uh, use the chat option to let me know and I will try my very best to help you behind the scenes. Uh, please note that due to the current situation with COVID-19, our webinar platform Zoom is experiencing a lot of traffic. So if during this session you experience any lag or any connection issues, uh, we apologize in advance. So as a registered attendee, you will have the ability to log out and back into the session uh, with the same credentials. Um, and if you have any issues or experience any difficulties logging back to the session due to the maximum capacity, just send us an email and we'll see if we can get you back in uh, as soon as possible. Uh, this webinar session is being recorded and it will be made available for on-demand consumption within 24 hours, hopefully sooner than that. Uh, you may find the recording up on our YouTube channel, which can be found by visiting the COVID-19 page on our website. I will go ahead and throughout the session today, post that link in the chat, so make sure you watch for that. Uh, resources tied to this session, such as the Certificate of Participation, uh, will be also available up on our website. Um, and, and if you didn't catch any of this information, don't worry, an email reminder will go out to all registered folks um, within 24 hours. Uh, we encourage your participation today, so uh, we welcome your questions and comments. Just uh, make sure you use the Q&A option so we can log them accordingly, and we will do our very best, uh, if time permits, to address them live. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our topic, Preventing Infectious Disease in Early Child Care and the Role of Technology. And uh, our speaker today will be Bill Williams at Innovative Healthcare Solutions. Thank you, and take it away, Bill. Thanks, Fernando. I appreciate it. And first of all, I will have to um, confess this is the very first web webinar that I've done in my career. So I, uh, I hope it goes along well. It's different talking to a screen versus people. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well out there. Uh, I wanted to just first of all say thank you to Dave and Fernando for allowing us to uh, participate in their Region 9 seminars and uh, the webinars. So I really do appreciate it. And my hope today is that you'll get a couple of things out of this presentation that you can take back, not only to your centers, but to your homes as well. Uh, most of this, you're gonna find that it's things that you have already heard of. It's things that you know. Uh, but most of the time when I've done this at Region conferences before, uh, it it's always provides a few tidbits of information that people weren't quite ready to or didn't quite understand or it was new information that they could take back with them. So that's my goal for today to be able to help you with this, particularly in, in, in the time that we're in today with this pandemic and what you're facing, uh, not only in our, our Head Start communities, but frankly, in, in all industries across the United States. Second thing I wanted to say is I really wanted to tell all of you, this is only my second year. I, my, my small company, Innovative Healthcare Solutions, we've only been in Head Start for two years. We launched our participation in um, the Region 4 conference in February of 2018. I wanted to say to all of you out there, um, I admire and have grown to love this industry with all my heart. My wife and I both are in it. We uh, are dedicated in ourselves to uh, bringing helpful and useful information and tools to the Head Start and early childhood, uh, childhood uh, uh, community. But I admire what all of you do uh, with a passion. And I just wanted to say thank you for what you do in terms of taking care of the kids that you do. The work you go, you go through every day and the work you do sometimes does not get necessarily noticed. But I wanted you to know that we don't do anything but early childhood and particularly focus on Head Start anymore. And I have uh, really felt it sort of in my second career that it has become um, a, a, a passion for me as well as my wife. I spent 40 years in healthcare uh, before uh, 
bringing this uh, type, these types of things to the public sector. So um, my background is, again is in healthcare, and I hope you again get a little bit of something out of this. So we're going to talk about bacteria, viruses, and invasive pests, um, and it has been a constant battle for, since 1965, and particularly given what we know today, it's going to continue to be a constant battle. So we're going to take a look at the tools for controlling the spread of uh, infectious diseases. And first and foremost, not only is it you take care of the tools, but the, the things that we can do from a people perspective is very important. Um, most people don't think about this, but if you look at the age groups of people that you're um, interacting with, particularly our young kids, toddlers, babies, um, unfortunately, viruses and bacteria tend to focus on those that are the, the, um, the most uh, um, susceptible to things that are going on. So our children and then our older adults are, are more susceptible to some of these things than other folks within society. It's important to make sure that all of us get the nutrition we need, the sleep, the exercise, the immunizations um, that we're, we'll go into the helpful practices about washing hands, uh, correctly covering coughs, um, and, and touching our face and hands, and you know all the little ones that put their hands and face and in every in everything that goes on out there is very difficult. At, at, you know, at, at any given time, as we're in groups, and particularly we've heard probably ad nauseum from our um, uh, our healthcare providers around what we're facing today with COVID-19, the social distancing is incredibly important. Um, quarantine, quarantining those that, that have, uh, may have uh, symptoms that they're facing, um, safe activities around uh, gathering, uh, just all the things that we as people can do to accommodate not spreading different viruses and bacteria in general we probably are the most, um, one of the biggest factors in terms of what we do and how we handle ourselves is a huge impact on whether this will continue to spread or not spread. So environments, this is something I typically uh, cover within the, the CEU credits, within the region uh, conferences, but it's, I think it becomes even more in, engaging today with what we're going through with COVID-19. Many of you, I, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm, I'm from the South, and uh, most of my customers and Head Start facilities that I go into today are repurposed school systems or repurposed high schools, elementary schools, et cetera. So many of you don't have the ability to kind of have an, an impact on facility design, et cetera. But if you're ever in an opportunity, have the opportunity to uh, design a new building um, with the addition of uh, funds coming for more early head starts, more opportunity with uh, child care uh, providers in, in terms of partnership. If there's ever that opportunity that you have in helping to design a particular facility, there are industrial engineers out there today that spend nothing, all of their time designing um, spaces that are environmentally uh, correct and also in designing spaces that limit the amount of opportunity to spread germs, bacteria, and viruses. So if you, if you really, if you get into that opportunity within your grantee to ever do that, hire one of these folks, let them help you design one uh, that actually can improve that workflow, can improve the, the, the settings that you have to be involved in, make things easier, et cetera. Um, I, I, and I've been in a couple of those and it's actually amazing about how design of a building, where they put what they, um, uh, bathrooms, where they put water fountains, where they have you design from going from classroom to playground and things of that nature. It's amazing the efficiency that they can um, instill in that design as well as uh, how that design then helps to limit the 
the amount of area that's impacted by moving traffic is what I call it. So if you ever have that opportunity, please do take advantage of that. All right, this is probably what everybody's um, wanting to take a look at with bacteria and viruses. And I know again, that you're getting inundated with all kinds of things that are out there, everything that's going on with the pandemic we're facing today. Um, I know that there is, it's interesting to me when first this first came out in uh, early March or, or February, was that most of the TV channels were talking about the need to wash hands and to sanitize surfaces and to carefully watch how we're distancing each other from ourselves. And I'm screaming at the TV screen, this is what I told people for two years. So um, it was almost vindication for the things that some of the, the uh, parts of the presentation that we've been doing for two years on this subject. But literally, washing hands is one of the most elemental and the, one of the most important aspects that we can do as humans right now into limiting the amount of uh, spread of these germs. So the, it's, it's one of those things that I said at the beginning of the, t the, the um, presentation that these are the things that you know. But if you typically what I do in this, if we had a setting where I'm in front of you, I would start asking you at this point, how many times during the day do you know that the regulations and what the, the, pro, the processes that you follow are telling you to wash your hands? And you know, things like before meals, after and after you go to the bathroom, upon entering the class, uh, entering the building, before leaving the building, you know, the, all the different times that you have regulations as to how many times you wash. And typically we come up with about 15 different times of the day that you wash your hands. Now, before this pandemic hit, rarely was there anyone in the class, maybe one or two, that when I honestly asked and said, how many of you in a six hour day, eight hour day, while you're at school or in your center, uh, why, how many of you actually washed your hands 15 to 16 times a day? So think about that. This is something you need to start paying more attention to. And I know everybody's heard the, 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 the um, happy birthday song. And I have a friend that says he figured out the Lord's prayer is 23 seconds. So he says the Lord's prayer every time he washes his hands. So it's, it's very important. This is one of those times, again, that it's so very important to have a good scrub, wash your hands. By washing your hands, it takes the oils and the uh, properties that germs, uh, bacteria and viruses grab onto and gets them off of your hands. The soap doesn't necessarily always kill everything, but it takes everything off and gets it down the drain. It cleans your hands as well as sanitizing your hands um, at, in that process. So as I say, make it fun. There's routine times where you normally do it. Um, one of the things that I was talking to a customer yesterday, they were worried about, okay, when kids come back, do you have a plan already in place upon arrival and dismissal? She was uh, talking to the fact that every time, she, if she's not working the, the um, car line, then what is she doing is that she's holding a child's hand. She's taking them to their caregiver, taking to them their parent or guardian. When they're coming in, she's holding that child's hand and taking them to the classroom. And her comment was that, is she going to wash her hands between every one of those children? And the simple answer is yes. Right now you have to. If you're not, you're moving germs from one hand of that child to another child's hand, et cetera. Uh, the other alternative is using gloves. The problem with that is you're gonna have to change the glove after every child. So these are the things that you got, unfortunately, you've got to think about when you, when it's time to go back to the centers, we got to think about what are we going to do with those types of processes that will help you then limit that amount of outbreak within your centers. So make it fun. 
but you have to think again, this is going to change our life. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to be one of those times that this pandemic is going to affect how we do things um, moving forward for quite a long time. And it's going to require all of us to think of new techniques, new ways of accomplishing some of the stuff that you already do, that you already know how to do, but we've got to re refine it. All right, let's talk about, you know, the elephant in the room, um, COVID-19. COVID-19 basically is a, a, a part of the coronavirus uh, umbrella. It is uh, part of those Nobel viruses that are out there uh, in terms of that particular family. Um, it, we know that it has come from an animal. I think um, from an, I'm, not, I'm not a physician, don't claim to be, but I, based on what I have read and heard um, and listened to and studied is that uh, the thing that is impacting us so profoundly is the fact that our body has not built up any antibodies or immunity to this particular virus because this particular virus came from um, an animal. So until this thing gets in us, until this particular virus gets in you and, and has the ability, we have the ability to, bring, to build up immunity to it, it's gonna be a problem for us in the United States for a long time. One of the things I always talk about too is that is how many of you have had a flu shot this year? I'm of that age where I need a flu shot every year. But my doctor, frankly, is very um, honest with me about the fact that only about 30 to 40 percent of the viruses or um, uh, the, the viruses that are out there today that that particular strain uh, or that particular dose of uh, flu shot have an impact to. It's normal. So it's important for us though, as, a, as human beings to be able to um, work and, and allow our body to build antibodies toward those particular germs and bacteria. This is also the challenge because what has happened here with COVID-19 is that it, because it came from an animal, it impacted us that we don't have the ability to fight it off in our own bodies but many of the things that we've done over the years to combat germs and bacteria and viruses, those particular um, um, bacteria and viruses have built up uh, immunity or uh, they've become less susceptible to the things that we're using today to kill them. So the Cloroxes of the world and the, the 409s and all those things that are out there today, unfortunately, many times are the germs and, and, and viruses and bacteria have, um, have built up their own immunity to what we're doing to them. So we have to now start looking at what do we do differently? You know, you've been basically sanitizing things the same way since 1965. It hasn't changed other than maybe utilizing some chemicals. That also kind of has an impact on some of the things that we're doing because those germs are within your center are building up resistance to that, that particular dose of bleach water. So it's things like this that you gotta start, we as a, as a country have to start thinking about as to how we're gonna deal with this. Um, so next. Coronavirus particles are surrounded by a fatty hour layer. It's, it's an enveloped um, uh, organism. Uh, the good part is that enveloped organisms are, hard, are less hard to kill. Um, Non-enveloped organisms are very difficult to kill, like norovirus, for example. Norovirus uh, it lasts a long time on a non-porous surface. It actually lasts for eight days. The, it is a um, non-enveloped uh, uh, pathogen, and it is very hard to kill it uh, enough to where it's not and it has, doesn't have an impact on us. We will get this battle with COVID-19 taken care of. We will get to the place where we know what to do about it. Uh, but right now, it's, it's scary. Uh, there will be a vaccine. Uh, and our, our physicians and doctors and everyone is telling us the right things to do in terms of taking care of this. 
the things that you've used in the past, bleach water, chemicals, um, you know, uh, the, the, the cleaners that say they 99.9% .9 for sanitizing, those are, are what we have today besides some technology that I'll introduce to you later. Those are the things we have today to be able to make our centers more uh, um, uh, germ free. And I think it's up to us to make sure that not only do you want to be confident that you're uh, going back into a safe work environment, but we also owe it to our parents that their children are going back into that safe work environment too. All right, going back to the, this, we've talked about the washing hands. Uh, we're going to a little bit talk about cleaning and sanitizing surfaces now. So I love this picture. She's had a great time finger painting. Um, but what does really clean mean? Uh, and what is the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and sterilizing? So there's the, the EPA is, is the organization that regulates most of what we do in and around these types of things. So clean is essentially getting that little girl's hands wiped off clean where it's not any residue left in the paint. It is wiping the counter. It is taking a shower with, with soap and water. Um, it, is, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that clean is not necessarily sanitizing or disinfecting and certainly not sterilizing. So let's talk about the differences. So the, the EPA identifies sanitizing, disinfecting, and then sterilizing in three different ways. Sanitizing is, it's easy to call it the three nines. It's 99.9% .9 of bacteria kill. It is, it, 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 that it, from sanitizing, it reduces, it doesn't eliminate the germ, but it takes the germ to a level that uh, it doesn't cause disease. And it's acceptable practice today within our Head Start communities to be f utilizing the sanitizing modes or the three nines. Disinfecting, if you want to take it up a notch and get to a disinfectant, it requires a disinfectant to be um, um, uh, appropriate for viruses. So norovirus, coronavirus, we've got to disinfect them to really kill them, but that's a 99.999 or 99.9 for viruses and 99.999 for bacteria kills. It means that there's less than 0.1001% of those bacteria still being viable uh, within that source. So the disinfectant piece destroys an inactive infectious fungi and bacteria and not necessarily the spore. The spore, it, the fungi is what is, is growing when that bacteria is on a, on a surface and moving and starting to grow. The spores are then released into the air. Into the air, once they come down and land on something, then they become the, the, the fungi again. So it, the disinfectant doesn't necessarily get what's in the atmosphere. That's why this, when you see these um, uh, depictions of the cough coming out from COVID-19, those are those, those are those spores that are going all out in the air that can be uh, contagious. And obviously, I didn't put it on the slide, but obviously sanitizing is what typically we see in our healthcare community at um, 100%, uh, utilizing extremely high heat to kill essentially everything and anything that happens to be on that, um, on whatever they're, they're trying to sanitize, or excuse me, um, to uh, sterilize. So hopefully that's cl clear. And it'll be more clear in just a second. Okay. Actually, I'm gonna go back for a second. So, Fernando, I'm gonna stop the share and show this for a second. I wanna show you something. All right, give you a, well, wait a minute. I'm out of, I'm out of, I'm sorry. I'm out of, uh, I'm gonna share it again. Cause I'm out of, out of my own. Let's go one more place. There we go. Back up. Sorry, sorry. Human uh, malfunction. All right, so current methods we use 
and taking care of sanitizing and cleaning our surfaces. I call it the dump, the, the, the dinking and the dumping of uh, bleach water, immersing, rinsing, and air drying. All of you have had experience doing that every day. Wiping, spraying down with chemicals, treating with heat, uh, kind of is the same scenario around uh, sterilization where they're uh, high heat to kill the organisms that are there. You're using dishwashers on the sanitized cycle, washing machines to kill things in porous surfaces like our uh, stuffed toys and things that just you can't, um, you, you can't uh, get with a non -por or that's not a non porous surface. So the important thing though is to think about what is dwell time? So I can't see you, but I bet if I ask the raise hands that how many of you take uh, the, the 409 or the Clorox bottle and spray it on your counter and wipe it down? Well, what has happened is basically you, you've done nothing but use a liquid to clean your counter. Most people in the United States don't understand the dwell time perspective. If you're going to utilize a chemical, you have to look on the back of the chemical bottle. The EPA requires every chemical that states it's 99.9 .9 bacteria cleaner, 99.9 .9 of bacteria and viruses clean, it states on the back how long the chemical has to sit there unintended to how long it needs to sit there before it has actually killed the virus or the bacteria. It's found on the labeling on the back of the bottle. And dwell time can, can vary by product. And this is where I'm gonna try to show you something here. All right, so you see, this is Mr. Clean. It says 99.9% .9 of bacteria, big letters up here. If I go to the back and see on the back of this, it tells me that this particular solution has to sit on the counter for 10 minutes, unattended, letting it sit there before it's, it's actually, before you wipe it off and, and finish up your, your cleaning process. I'll give you another example. The Clorox bottle, most every, by the way, these all came from our, our sink under, uh, um, underneath the sink. This one says, again, 99.9 .9 of bacteria and viruses killed. On the back, where you're looking for where it says, it actually tells us that it's 30 seconds. This time, 10 minutes, 30 seconds. 409, multi-surface cleaner, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses. On the back, five minutes. This one has to sit five minutes before it's effective. And then last, what we're all using today, these days, our lovely Clorox wipes or whatever type of disinfectant wipe you're using, says 99.9% .9 of, of viruses and bacteria. And on the back on this one, it's four minutes. It's four minutes, and how many of you take these, pull them out, wipe things down off your phone, off your keypad, off your electronics, everything that you're doing, and then wipe it up? It's important for all of these that I just showed to be able to put them on to the, the surface you're um, taking care of and letting them sit. Most of the time, it's even best to let them dry to get a complete um, a cleaning. Now, the other difference is that, particularly with the liquids, the, the dwell time, and I'm gonna go back with sharing my screen again, The dwell time is actually different for every particular lot that that, that manufacturer provides. So they'll have a batch of the uh, Mr. Clean and they'll have a batch of the Clorox cleaner and bleach. They'll use that batch up. They'll get ready for another batch. And then all of a sudden the, the, the actual dwell time can actually change. So it's important for everybody to when you're utilizing these types of chemicals at your home as well as your in the centers to see what you're doing. Even your commercial cleaners are required to put on their labeling how long it takes for that particular cleaner to last and sit before it is um, sanitized.
or disinfect it. Um, so that's enough for that. Okay, we got, got to do this the right. There we go. Okay. So some issues around sanitizing and disinfected that we've been dealing with um, here lately. Obviously, gloves. Today's time. I mean, you're 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 really needing to spend you know, use gloves more often than you would. When we talked about a little while ago, um, with dismissal and arriving when children come in, if you're holding hands and taking them down. You're going to wash your hands in between or utilize gloves, but you're going to go through 20, 30, 60 pairs of gloves, uh, particularly every day. Because it kills me when I go to the, uh, the fast food places and stuff and see them taking glo using gloves, but they'll fix one hamburger and do all this, and then they'll, they keep the gloves on all day. So what good does it do? Um, it, it, those things that, unfortunately, have made me a little bit OCD at this point in time. So... It's important for you as a as a um, as a, uh, a Head Start center and the folks at work to determine what kind of policy you want to make with in, when it comes to utilizing the gloves within the center. Hand sanitizers. This is a great topic, particularly right now. Everybody says, okay, you need to utilize hand sanitizers when you don't have soap and water. Only when you don't have soap and water, because and you need a hand sanitizer that has at least sixty percent alcohol within the solution that you're getting. If it's not 60%, then it's not being effective for what you need it to do and what you want it to do on your hands. Uh, the problem is most of them are toxic. If used over long term, they can actually get in your, your body. I'm gonna actually, um, nope, don't have that. So, uh, where's the one? If you're washing your hands less because the alcohol hand sanitizer makes you feel confident that your hands are clean, this is coming from Duke University Medical Center. All of a sudden you can become a vehicle for alcohol resistant organisms. So it's, it, I, I've had people within my sessions before that say that they use hand, san hand sanitizers 10 to 15 times a day. If you're using that much, one, it's not working for you anymore because your body's become, um, is becoming immune to it. The organisms are becoming immune to it. Two, uh, you're, you're, by using it that much, you're building up resistance to it anyway. Uh, and most of the time, that's not har it's, not, it's harmful for you because they actually have studies that, that use it that many times that show that some of that stuff can be harmful to, um, to molecules within our body. So it goes back to the hand washing. It's, it's wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And Use that bacterial, I'd use it. Um, use it when there's nothing else available to use, not as a substitute for washing hands, because you, it, over time, you can uh, develop a resistance to it. And that bacterial soaps. I'm always uh, using this analogy when I go talk about the soaps, is that I'm, so, I'm probably sure that m many of you on this call today have actually uh, had some type of surgery or had some type of um, um, something that you've had to do for outpatient, et cetera. When your doctor gave you the little bottle of antibacterial soap to be used at the morning of or the night before, that's real antibacterial soap. That's why it costs $25 for two ounces. The antibacterial soaps you see on the, the shelves of our local grocery stores really are not recommended, nor are they required, because most of the time they don't contain anything or enough of any property within them to be effective for killing, frankly, any bacteria or viruses. So if, there, if you're spending more money because you think that antibacterial soap is helping you, stop. Go to another type of soap. If you like that antibacterial soap because you like it, keep buying it, but don't have that self um, don't become you know, satisfied that that's taking care of the bacteria that you need to get off your, your hands and body. Usually I say any questions here, but we'll, we'll keep going. Big, big thing today is, and you know, Head Start has a policy for everything. I have come to learn that I thought Head Start, um, I thought head, healthcare was um, bureaucratic in nature. Head Start uh, and early childcare have 
lots and lots and lots of policies, but to the, for the betterment of the kids and for the betterment of the staff. And I agree with them. But I, I love the fact that you have policies pretty much for everything. And you have policies around informing your parents and staff about what's going on in the classroom, what child has been sick and sent home, et cetera, et cetera. But these things have become now um, to the nth degree of need to be able to communicate from your parents from home to, to school and back. It's really important to talk to your parents about the things we're talking to you about now, about what they can do in the home to be able to be more prepared for when that time comes that, the, you know, that, that they need to prepare their home for. Um, it's important to make sure policy-wise, regular medical reports are up to date and it's certain we're taking care of children with special needs. But I would encourage you to have, um, if you can get a copy of this or the, the CDC and the World Health Organization, as well as Head Start, have tremendous amounts of great information to send with homes with, send parents, excuse me, send home to parents um, about the things that they can do in the home of things like we're talking about uh, to be able to, to take care of them at home. So it's, it's become even more important for, um, I had a discussion with a customer yesterday that they are uh, now, will be stopping everybody at the door coming in, taking their temperature real quick, making sure that the child doesn't have a temperature. And they even started talking about um, taking the temperature of the parent that's delivering them, just to make sure. So sort of being that, you know, ultra conservative in terms of what we do. The key here is, is that, that old perspective that more is better. Now, I don't mean that you pour a teaspoon of Clorox or bleach water, bleach into a gallon of water. I don't mean two or three teaspoons because that becomes toxic. What I mean is time, times that we um, uh, that we wash our hands, that we sanitize what's around us, that we work diligently to get every nook and cranny taken care of, more is better. It's always going to be better. So the more things you can get to, the more things you can sanitize, the more things that are available for you to utilize to make that happen, it's important to do that. Okay. The last piece of the presentation, we'll talk about invasive pests. So, interesting enough, uh, we'll talk about lice and, um, and bed bugs. Uh, I always kind of talk to the fact that this is, lice is a situation these days that if you haven't had an attack, it's, it's amount of not if, but when. Um, it, the lice and the tough part about lice is that child brings it typically from home. You'll do the things you need to do in the center to take care of it. Child goes home, child brings it back. Constant sort of that um, constant uh, back and forth that occurs. So again, back to communicating to the parents, it's important to, for them to understand what is required. And they may not have the, the, the type of dryer at home that gets to 131 degrees for 30 minutes to be able to kill the things that, that are there. And unfortunately, um, it's expensive to have uh, commercial uh, pest control people come and uh, take care of things like that at the home. So it's, it's kind of a tough, tough thing to deal with, um, but they are becoming more and more prevalent within our society, unfortunately. The big piece is to be able to kill the nit, which is the, it's the, the little things within the scalp, within the pores of the hair that become um, a, a breeding ground for lice. Um, the only really way to do it and take care of them now is to use a method of heat, as I said, that goes to 131 degrees um, or a, a closed dryer, commercial dryer, uh, and then a, a, a professional exterminator. Unfortunately, other than some technologies that we'll talk about in a few minutes, there's really not more than this to, to utilize. 10 years ago, we never talked about bed bugs. Um, unfortunately, these days we are. Um, bed bugs are warm-blooded uh, animals. They love to latch on to 
um, uh, us, animals, anything that is a warm blooded uh, um, American, they, they, they will, they're not discriminatory. They will be happy to, to take a ride on us. Um, they aren't harmful. They don't pass uh, disease at this point. Um, we've not seen that, uh, but they are a nuisance and they do create uh, where you'll itch, you'll, your skin becomes uh, irritated, it'll become red. Uh, sometimes it affects people worse than it does other people. But really, the, again, the only effective um, uh, uh, decision to use with killing them is high heat. Same kind of thing using a clothes dryer, if that, that clothes dryer will get that hot, or commercial drying cabinet, or again, um, uh, professional uh, pest control uh, in terms of using chemicals to get rid of them. All right, after all this, it's kind of the things that I'd like to leave you with is, you know, as I said earlier in the presentation, you've been sanitizing essentially the same way since 1965. And it's really time for us to take a look at new technologies that are out there in the marketplace. Um, a lot of companies are out there utilizing hydrogen peroxide, aerosolized uh, hydrogen peroxide that comes out of very fine mist. Uh, it doesn't wet things up. It can be used on um, electronics because it doesn't create a, a, a wet barrier, so to speak. But it's just very, it's at a higher concentration than the hydrogen peroxide that we buy from the grocery store. It's at a 70% hydrogen peroxide concentration. And, and it kills the bacteria and viruses um, that it comes in contact with, but then dissipates back to oxygen once that process is, has been completed. Ozone, ozone, most people think about it as being in the atmosphere. Uh, we, we've actually been utilizing ozone, which is made by passing oxygen by ultraviolet light. It loves bacteria, loves viruses, loves to just eat them up and kill them but then it dissipates back to oxygen and goes back to O2. So it doesn't require venting, it doesn't require special equipment, it doesn't require a lot of things that you would think about. It's a great nature's um, sanitizer. Uh, it, it's been to, to kind of counteract that it's just this bad thing up in the, in the ozone, in the atmosphere. Ozone's Tremendously, it's, it's primarily used in industry today in the United States, all across the country, water treatment plants, uh, meat and poultry industry use it on a daily basis. Coca-Cola, bottled water companies use it before they cap them to clean, uh, to, to sanitize the top of the bottles. You'll see it in HVA systems, the air conditioning systems in offices and at homes where they'll pass the, um, the air conditioning by an, uh, an ultraviolet light. Um, football teams, uh, sports teams use it for uh, ozone infused water in their washing systems in addition to detergent. And the latest trend lately is ozone is really starting to look at replacing uh, chlorine by utilizing ozone within swimming pools. Um, many companies like Clorox, Johnson Johnson, you see from the list, offer these kinds of products. Uh, the company I represent, Zono Technologies, does it well. And if, uh, if you're interested and would like to take a look at some of those things as time goes on, you know, just please let us know. So I'll leave you with a couple of good books that somebody gave me, uh, myself and my wife at some point um, when we first started out this, that I, and I'm finding that most Head Starts have these books in place, but they're awesome use their you, great books to use for review of things that you can do on a regular basis as we are, as I said at the outset, 99% of the stuff that we talked about, you already know. Some of this probably dwell time, some of the other things you probably may didn't, you didn't know. And now that will correct, you'll correct yourself in terms of how you sanitize at the center and at home. But my goal again was to make sure that you came away with a few things to think about as you go back to your centers when time when that time comes. So what I'd like to leave you with is to think about this. How do you sanitize a lot of these things today? And recognizing sanitizing something once a week 
uh, or once a month. These days, it, it's just not sufficient. So it's an overwhelming list. You think about the time consuming um, nature of it, but there are ways to get this done. How do you take a look at things like books, puzzles, crayons, Play-Doh, uh, cots, mats, crib mattresses, car seats, let your parents bring car seats and strollers in, all the things that are there, uh, the electronics in the office, uh, or electronics that are used by, um, that you buy from Kaplan and places like that and Lakeshore that are in the classroom. How do you clean, I mean, how do you sanitize those? Because a lot of those can't be used with, with chemicals, with liquid chemicals. So we've got to start thinking about ways of being able to take care of these things as well. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this was beneficial for you, uh, a bit of time with uh, a Southerner. I appreciate it. Um, if you've got questions or would like to get more and further information, uh, please reach out to me. I'd also invite you to, um, uh, Mr. Condon has been nice enough to let us uh, provide another webinar on April the 28th, where we'll be uh, specifically talking about some of these technologies that we talked about at the end that allow for us to be able to sanitize more and more. Um, we'll have that webinar on the 28th and I invite you to join us. Fernando? Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, Bill, for your time and knowledge. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have about 15 minutes uh, remaining in our session and we do have uh, quite a bit of questions. So if you don't mind, Bill, um, let me read those aloud to you and see if we can get an answer for uh, everybody who submitted a question. So um, the one question asks, what about using bleach in the dishwasher? Uh, you know, it's, it's a good question. Um, you, you know, there, I don't think there's anything out there that I've seen so far that identifies the specifics about what you can use, but it would probably be no different than taking a, a, a think about it as the water that's run through the dishwasher is the same thing as the water that you put the teaspoon of Clorox or bleach water in. It, it might, it might help. I, I can't tell you if it's a, if it would, th there's no studies right now that I've seen where actually putting it in the dishwasher would have that mitigate. Um, common knowledge, I think it would help because you're going to have the heat as well as then a small amount of bleach and then, you know, the, the water itself. So it, it, that might help. Excellent. So next question asks, what is the difference between Clorox and bleach? Not a thing. Um, one is a, 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 it's sort of like Kleenex. Kleenex had become synonymous with uh, tissue for years and years and years, but it can be the, 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 uh, the Walmart brand, the, the uh, Target brand, that Clorox is a brand name. Um, and most of us, it's sort of like in the South, we don't say cola. Everybody says, when are you gonna get again Coke? Well, that could be a Sprite or something else. It's, but there's nothing, no difference. Next question, um, any products that I can make at home, kids and pet friendly? Uh, say that again, Fernando. Is it make it kid and, and pet friendly? Yes. Yeah, so right? any products that uh, you would recommend that are uh, kids and pet friendly? Okay. So most of the products that we have the opportunity to buy within the grocery stores, et cetera, um, they will come on the, again, I'm, I'm a big proponent of being able to look on the back of labels. Most of them will actually uh, are also required to put safe, um, safe, measures that are uh, there for our children and pets and those that are um, harmful particularly to pets I've got um, we're a dog family we've got three dogs so we're very careful about the things that we put on the floors or places that our dogs go to make sure that there's no residue of anything there that would be harmful to them but luckily and fortunately most every product you have it, it will have something on the back that allows for um, you to make sure that it's okay to be used at home. In addition to the, the, the concentrations of harmful chemical that we use in the home, 
um, is such a mo uh, excuse me such a a lower amount of concentration to be t harmful. The biggest thing is you don't want to you know have a toddler's so while we lock the cabinet below the sink. Have a toddler be you know take a sip of this kind of stuff. But as we use it in the counter, by the time the residue is gone, if you use it appropriately, then wipe it down. Uh, after that then the residue is not there enough to be harmful to your kids. Excellent. Um, I did see this uh, particular question. They're asking, what are your thoughts on homemade face masks? Um, I think if we don't work in the healthcare environment, and I believe, uh, I've actually read an article about M95 masks versus uh, the masks that we make for around um, with, with bandanas, et cetera. If we don't uh, work in the healthcare environment where you're, you're constantly in attacked in the atmosphere and everything you're doing, you have to be careful with. At the home, as we move to a grocery store, um, I think absolutely the homemade masks are appropriate. The, the, the thing that I would recommend or that I've seen recommended um, as I've researched this is that you, you need to make sure that the material you're using is a, a bit of a density that at least it feels like you're not getting, you know, little, small, just make it dense enough, uh, like a handkerchief, um, that a men's handkerchief, uh, a, a bandana you would use, a, a thick scarf. Um, we use uh, the old fashioned baby diapers uh, that were the, the white terry cloth type baby diapers. I've used those to create the mask for us and our family when we go to, um, to grocery stores. So I, I absolutely believe in that. Um, unfortunately, with COVID-19 right now, uh, because it is an airborne pathogen, uh, it, they say that 90% of it is passed through human contact, but we don't know enough about the airborne pathogen as people um, cough right now. So I, I tend to stay on the safe side and wear those when I'm out um, at the grocery store, but pretty much that's all we've been to lately. So next question asks, how about bleach and water mix for disinfectant? We let it sit for two minutes at the center. Is it effective? Yes. Um, the only difference you'll get from sanitized to disinfectant is the length of time you let that um, uh, chemical stand from a dwell time perspective. So actually, you know, even on the bottle of the, of the Clorox bottle that you're, or the bleach, that you buy commercially for your center will have on the back of it uh, how long it would take to not only sanitize, but then also to disinfect. So typically it's the longer it stays, the longer, it, um, the, the more effective it becomes at, at a disinfectant. You'll never get sterilization, but it, as a disinfectant, it will get, um, uh, uh, you'll get better results the longer it's there. So you're, you're in good shape. Uh, do you recommend that the children wear a mask? Um, you know, I'm gonna, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'm gonna pass that one sort of to the healthcare officials. Um, because of where we, the information we don't know right now, I'm, I'm, I don't feel qualified to be able to answer that question specifically. I will tell you if it was my child, I might ask them to do that. And maybe that gives me a false sense of um, security. But I, I particularly, I, and actually I heard um, this being talked about uh, amongst a group of um, uh, Office of Head Start folks last week in terms of needing to get some more data or let some of the more professional level epidemiology kind of people um, have an answer to that question. Because that once you do that, then everybody's got to wear. I mean, you're. I mean, you're really talking about. You know, some of you are huge centers. Some of you are small centers. But when you start talking about every child having to wear a, a face mask, particularly when they're young, and I mean, Lord, we can hardly keep the clothes on them, much less a face mask. Uh, is it good to use vinegar to disinfect? Um, the, the vinegar does have a property. I mean, yes, the short answer is yes. Again, that is one of those two 
that it's important. That, and, and unfortunately, there's not a label on it because they don't claim uh, to be a sanitizer. But I have um, I've heard this before. Checked out it. Checked it out. Um, and it it is used as a sanitizer. I would not uh, necessarily think that it would have the be ability to kill or disinfect viruses, um, particularly those that are uh, non-enveloped, like norovirus. Um, it, I think it would take too long to allow the, the, um, the substance to be uh, effective. We have time for a, a few more questions. Uh, Natalie asks, does the liquid have to remain wet during the dwell time? Yes, good, good question. Great question. In fact, it will identify that it's, it needs to stay wet. And if it dries or, or if you have put the, uh, the, the um, solution on a countertop, for example, say the back of the bottle says it needs to stay there for four minutes. If that solution dries before that four minutes, you, you have not gotten to the dis disinfectant or sanitized level based upon the, 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 what they're talking about. Because what happens is when it dries, it dissipates. So the molecules, they're not there necessarily. The thing I don't like about this too is that unfortunately where we are, it, it requires us to kind of go back and wipe things down because you do get a residue. You, you do have the opportunity for a residue there that you don't want um, little hands then going from there to their mouths or I mean I've been in head starts or actually my own child um, putting you know their mouth all over the table uh, so it's important to wipe these things down but the short answer was you need to the, sur the surface or the chemical to be still wet and create the whole time frame that was a great question Okay, so the next question, does microfiber cloth help clean surfaces? Yes, um, and, and it's because mainly it has um, a property within the stitching, within the, the, um, you know, the textile engineering part of it that allows for it to grab hold of minute material uh, and do a better job of, of clinging to things than say a normal cotton a um, uh, diaper or, or, or frankly a cotton cloth would do. So uh, the challenge with microfiber is that it is not a good cloth for um, absorbing liquid. Uh, it, it doesn't absorb things like we go back to cotton. It doesn't absorb as well as other things. So if you're using it to clean with, um, it's if you just want to let things air dry, over time, it's good to use, but if you're trying to clean up something and it, it or sanitize or whatever with getting a, 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 a wet environment up, it's not a, not a great tool. Excellent. Well, that's just about uh, how much time we have today. I just want to have enough time to thank Bill again for his time and all the uh, great information he shared with us. We received a lot of good feedback on the chat. Um, very appreciative of all the information he shared with us today. I just wanted to remind everybody again that this session was recorded. Um, and for all of you that have peers that were not able to join the live session, uh, we should have this uh, recording up on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully within 24 hours. And you can get a link to our YouTube account by going to our website. Uh, and I'll go ahead and share the link to this particular session where the recording is going to be linked to in the chat. Um, once again, I want to thank everybody for their time. Thanks, Bill. Um, and I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. And I hope to see you on the next, on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Be safe.